United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change on the initiative to reduce emissions from deforestation and degradation, referred to as RED. There's been a great deal of progress made with this, but what we're seeing is with this biofuels boom, we're seeing increasing threats to forest. So what we're going to discuss in this session is both the progress on RED and, and some of the issues with, with biofuels um, as, as they've arisen over the last couple of years. My specific talk is going to focus on the ripple effects of biofuels on tropical forests and, and carbon emissions. As I'm sure everyone in this room is aware, concern has been mounting that the increased production of biofuels might in fact increase net greenhouse gas emissions rather than, rather than decrease them. And this is, this is because these, these new biofuels are crop-based, so we're talking about things like corn, corn ethanol or palm oil biodiesel. And to produce more of these, of these biofuels, fuels will, will require expanding cropland. And the tropics is the area that this cropland is likely to expand. And the problem with this is that if these biofuels are replacing tropical forests, we know that we'll be emitting huge amounts of carbon to the atmosphere. And this is because in the tropics, when farmland expands and is replacing these forests, the trees are cut down and burned, and all of the carbon stored in those forests is released to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. And what happens is that this creates a, a carbon debt. And this is because the amount of carbon released from deforestation is much greater than the amount of carbon saved from, from using these biofuels. We used new, very detailed maps of vegetation carbon stocks and crop yields to look at just how many years are, are needed for this, this carbon payback. And what we found was that for very high yielding crops, things like sugarcane and oil palm, if they were to replace tropical forest, it will take 40 to 120 years for them to pay back that carbon debt. But for low yielding crops, things like corn or soybeans, cassava, it'll take 300 to 1500 years. So we're talking about a, a really long payback time period for this, this carbon debt to, to be repaid so that we can see the carbon benefits of, of biofuels. Um, and this, this really isn't surprising if you consider the fact that the world's tropical forests and savannas store more than 340 billion tons of carbon. And this amount of carbon is equivalent to 40 years of global fossil fuel emissions. So this is a, a huge amount of carbon that we want to keep stored in these forests. Um, and in fact, even if we consider advances in, in agricultural and biofuel technology, so major crop yield increases and advanced cellulosic biofuels, the story remains much the same. We still see that, that clearing tropical forests to grow biofuels will be a losing proposition in terms of, in terms of carbon emissions. Of course, if, if we're to plant a, a biofuel crop on a degraded land or marginal croplands, we will see biofuel, I'm sorry, we will see carbon benefits there right away, nearly immediately. So the, there is, is some good news in this. Um, this issue of where new, new biofuel croplands will come from has become increasingly controversial as the, the biofuels debate has been, been heating up. And this is partly because the land sources for new croplands is, is largely undocumented across the tropics. Most studies have just looked at the area of cropland and how that's increasing, but they haven't actually looked at where the new cropland is coming from or how that is expanding. I analyzed a, a very detailed satellite database from the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization um, to keep track of these land, of these land sources uh, across the tropics. And, and what we found is, is that we can definitively conclude that forests are the major source for, for new croplands as they expand. For example, in the 1990s, we saw that 50% of new croplands replaced forest, and another 30% replaced forests that had been disturbed by things like logging or, or small-scale agriculture. So this means that across the whole tropics, in total, 80% of new cropland came from forest. So if we continue on this path, we can, be, we can see that chances are good that if we're filling up our cars with biofuels produced in the tropics, we're going to be effectively burning rainforest in our gas tanks. In this case, it's the unintended greenhouse gas consequences of US, the recent U.S. ethanol policy of essentially producing 57 billion liters of ethanol uh, by 2020 per year. Um, and the, as it, in particular, how it pertains to deforestation and, and agriculture in Brazil, in the Amazonian portions of Brazil. The basic premise here, this connection that Holly's been talking about, is, is in fact that by moving to ethanol in the United States, we have to grow more corn. 
Uh, in the United States, that means growing less of something else, which is often soy, uh, since soy is intercropped with, uh, it's grown in rotation with corn. Um, and Brazil is the world's leading producer, exporter of soy currently. So any opportunity for more soy comes basically from Brazil. Um, so what we see in Brazil is a, a very large increase in soy planted area since 2007, uh, when the U.S. began uh, increasing ethanol production greatly. And the problem, of course, in Brazil is a, a portion of that, a large portion of any expansion comes from new deforestation. Um, and so we run into the, the, the problem of, of all that CO2 released from deforestation. Our major finding is that the emissions from deforestation in Brazil, even in Brazil, even under our best uh, scenarios for, for uh, the least amount of deforestation, still swamp any um, in, decrease in greenhouse gas emission in the United States, provided by the, the use of a, the ethanol instead of gasoline. So the bottom line is that we can't find a way that, that it makes greenhouse gas sense to burn ethanol in the United States made from corn. If it causes deforestation in the tropics, in particular in Brazil. To wrap it all up, we have Peter Fromhoff, who's the chief scientist of the climate campaign of the Union of Concerned Scientists, also in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. I, I, you heard from the first speakers that the uh, uh, climate science, since the release of the fourth assessment report, uh, has only pointed to uh, increasing risk at lower increases in temperature. Uh, and highlighting the urgency of reducing uh, our emissions of greenhouse gases. Uh, and you've heard from my colleagues on this afternoon's uh, panel that uh, one of the approaches uh, to reduce our emissions, to wean ourselves from fossil uh, sources of energy, particularly for fuel use, uh, to expand uh, biofuel production, uh, both in the United States and internationally, uh, may, if not well designed, inadvertently um, uh, have a net uh, a negative impact on, on emissions by exacerbating uh, rates of uh, deforestation in tropical countries and actually not be the climate solution uh, that we so desperately need. What I want to highlight are a couple of opportunities uh, to uh, bound uh, that challenge. I, just to, 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 you know, to, to, to reinforce the point, you know, if we're putting forward uh, investments in biofuels uh, without constraining these inadvertent uh, impacts on emissions, it's a little bit like, like weatherizing your house and, and, and deliberately keeping your windows open so you don't... Uh, uh, you know, you don't get the net uh, energy savings associated with it. It's just not a smart policy. Uh, fortunately, we are we have opportunities to build smart policies uh, to address this. Uh, in California, uh, for example, uh, uh, the state has adopted what's called a low carbon uh, fuel standard uh, to require uh, a decreasing uh, emissions of greenhouse gases from all sources uh, uh, to produce uh, fuels, including biofuels. Uh, and, and taking into account the indirect emissions uh, uh, from corn-based uh, ethanol and, and other crop-based uh, uh, sources. Uh, California is just uh, coming out with an assessment of how to do that quantitatively uh, that will be built into the rulemaking there and could set a national standard uh, should we move, as I believe we should, to a national low-carbon fuel standard as well. So that's one approach, to get the rules right, to be informed by the best available science, and to bound uh, uh, the sources of, of alternatives to fossil fuels so that we're getting real reductions in carbon emissions. Uh, the other point I want to make, uh, going back to what Holly Gibbs said, is that we also have an opportunity to create real value in, for standing forests as an alternative, uh, a, a, as a climate mitigation measure. Uh, tropical forests, current rates of deforestation account for something on the order of 15 to 20 percent uh, of uh, annual uh, uh, human-caused emissions of greenhouse gases, both in the international climate negotiations and here in, in, in development of U.S. climate policy, there's extraordinary momentum. Uh, uh, which is a real reverse from what there had been just a couple of years ago, uh, to build in the lead up to Copenhagen internationally next December uh, rules uh, through the development of the international carbon market to finance and create value for the carbon that's in tropical forests and create an economic incentive for local uh, decision makers, landowners and others uh, to keep those forests intact rather than to clear them, whether it be for agricultural crops uh, or other purposes. A lot of work to be done to make that happen, but. Um, uh, 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 but it's now a central part of the both international and domestic climate policy negotiations and a, and a real opportunity to provide a, a buffer uh, to the uh, increased uh, drivers of agricultural expansion, including but not limited to biofuel production. First, I should say that the emissions trajectory that we used for the AR4 was too optimistic in terms of its rates, N not based on projections, but based on, uh, you know, an effort to characterize sort of possible futures on which the world might evolve. And so it's not that there were predictions and the predictions were wrong. It's that we didn't think broadly enough about 
possible futures. And if you look at all of the world's major regions, there were none that had net decreases in CO2 emissions over the period from 2000 to 2007, even though ostensibly we're in a period where acute awareness of climate issues was broad-based. But the countries that had the sharpest increases in emissions and the countries that had the sharpest increases in the carbon intensity of their economy were the ones you would think of. It's the rapidly developing countries in the, in the industrializing world, and China in particular has a staggering increase in the rate of CO2 emissions and the, the carbon intensity of the economy, as does India. But it's important to remember in that context that China still has a per capita CO2 emissions that are only on the order of a sixth of what they are in the United States.